the book of Ezra in the month of January, our Bible study and Sunday school centered in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, during the month of February, we centered on the book of Esther. And now for March, April, and May, uh, we will center upon the book of uh, the Revelation. And I want you, if you would, to look with me to chapter 1, and we will read together verses 10 through 18. And God bless all of you who did not allow the uh, snow to stop you. Amen. I look at see all of these empty seats, and I'm thinking about how folk are plowing through uh, two feet of snow in other areas, and uh, we don't even have enough to stick. It's just blowing in the wind. And yet there are folk who couldn't come because of the snowstorm. <laughs> God bless all of you. <laughs> come on, let's read together. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded out, perhaps, with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp twig sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. We'll stop at that point. Noticing in particular the words of our Lord at the latter part of verse 17 and throughout verse 18. He says, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. I hear the Lord saying here, have no fear. The Lord is in control. Uh, I think you could tell somebody that. Have no fear. The Lord is in control. Amen. If I don't say anything else to you, uh, I want you to go out of here with that in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit that out of the many situations 
that we are involved in in this life, uh, there is no reason to fear. It's a strange thing about fear that although many situations give rise to fear, what we really fear is uncertainty. Fear is brought about because of unknown factors. Those persons who fear being evicted from their home and fear their automobile being repossessed, fear their utilities being cut off. If they knew that just before the deadline, they would come into the possession of the necessary amount of money to keep them from being evicted, to keep the car from being repossessed. If they knew the thing is gonna happen 10 days from now, but if they knew that around midnight, the night before all of this was to take place, that somehow, mysteriously, they would come into possession of the necessary amount of money, they would have no fear. Fear is brought about by the unknown. Why is it that people basically fear at night? Because under the cover of darkness, you cannot see what's going on. Uh, somehow you feel more confident. Uh, there may be a, a mugger standing down the road, but in the bright sunlight, you don't really fear it because you can see the person, you can see everything around, you can see where you need to run if you've got to have help, uh, you can see the cops standing over on the corner, and when things are light, basically you don't have the fear that you have at night, but you are fearful at night because of the unknown. Well, good example, you can sit up at home all day and hear uh, the house settling and a pop over here and, and a crack over here. But at night, <laughs> and nobody is there but you. And then you have a power failure on top of that. Every little pop and every little crack, you know that somebody is trying to break in on you. We fear the unknown. I was saying to the saints this morning at the 8 o'clock worship, and it may sound like I'm uh, digressing here, but in reality I'm not. I may be dealing with something that I'll come to later in uh, the passage of Scripture. But the world now is poised, awaiting December 31st, 1999, because nobody really knows when the calendar turns over. And December 31st, 1999 becomes January 1, 2000. Nobody knows what's going to happen. You're reading it in the newspaper, you're hearing it on television, the Y2K problem. As the year 2000 comes in, and computers that have been trained only to read the last two digits, and when it focus on double zeros, not knowing whether it's 1900 or the year 2000, some even fear that a nuclear holocaust could be released by some computer being confused and letting go of a nuclear missile. Others fear that uh, city power companies will shut down the utilities and in the dead of winter that houses will go dark and cold. Others fear that because of uh, how electronically 
Money can be transferred from one place to another. That financial institutions will leave people who were well-to-do with no worries about their future, according to the papers, will leave them penniless. Nobody really knows what is going to happen. And if we allow our imaginations to run away with us, we will become just like the other people of the world, lost in uncertainty, fearful of our future. But the Lord says to John on the Isle of Patmos, uh, that because of the Greco-Roman world, yes. the Roman power that was in authority and Greek culture and education that dominated, he uses the Greek letters of the alphabet, yes. alpha being the first, omega being the last. He said, I want you to know I'm A and Z. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm everything in between. You have no reason to fear because I've got it all in control. Oh, glory to God. You ought to tell somebody, have no fear. The Lord has it all in control. I hope you didn't close your Bible. Let, let's look at it. Some of you, I don't get to talk to you on Thursday night, so I may not preach this morning. I'm doing Bible study this morning. <laughs> you looking at it? Look at the first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the word revelation, that word is a revealing, it is an unveiling. Uh, whenever a thing is revealed, it does not mean it was not there, it was there all the time. But you could not see it until the veil was removed. I've often used the illustration that uh, behind these beautiful green drapes, uh, there is a baptistry. But those of you who are not here, say at 10.30 Sunday mornings when the drapes are open and the baptizing service is going forth, you would not necessarily know what is behind the drapes. But there is an electrical switch back there that once it is thrown, the drapes begin to part. And as they part, they reveal what is behind. The Lord wanted John to know that the future is going to happen. There are things that are going to come to pass. And in order that you might know what will come to pass, I will reveal it to you here and now. So it is the revelation and uh, your Bible may have, as many Bibles said, the revelation of St. John the Divine. Uh, that is an incorrect heading because it's not John's revelation. Look into the text. Verse 1 says it's the revelation of who? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it didn't even start with him. But it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, which Yahweh, which Jehovah, which the heavenly Father gave to him. The Father gave it to Jesus in order that Jesus might show it to his servant, the things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. It is important that uh, John is referred to here as a servant because when you uh, listen to the different arguments of biblical scholars, uh, 
Some of them will say that uh, this writing is not John, the beloved apostle, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, the beloved one that laid his head over on Jesus' breast uh, the night in which he was betrayed. Now that's who it is, but a lot of people will say that's not the John that it is speaking of because he does not refer to himself in the office of apostleship, but he only refers to himself as a servant. But you've got to understand the context of the book to know why he does not do like Paul and speak of apostolic authority, because there are times that it does not matter who you are. In the awesome presence of God, you become like John the Baptist that said he's going to increase and I'm going to decrease. So even though John was an apostle who walked around with Jesus on the earth, when he saw the glorified Christ, and this is what you see in the revelation, here you don't see uh, the one that uh, Isaiah prophesied about that'll be led as a lamb to the slaughter. One standing in the courtroom of Caiaphas being smitten by one of the soldiers. You don't see him as the little man that had nowhere to lay his head. You don't see him in Revelation as the lonely carpenter of Galilee. But here you see him as the glorified Lord with all power in his hand. And anybody, when you get the right kind of vision of God, it doesn't matter who you are. You are nothing but a servant. Hallelujah. Just honored to sit down at his feet. Let me go a little further here. John refers to himself as servant who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And listen to what he says. He's trying to get the preachers because later on you will see in this uh, that the seven stars are really the pastors of the churches. And he is writing to them and he wants the people in the congregation to be blessed by the visions that he had on the Isle of Patmos. So he says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. You got to understand that in my position as a jurisdictional bishop, I can write to the pastors and tell them, you know, that I want all of your members to know thus and so, but it's up to them. They can take the letter and throw it in the trash can if they want to. And John did not want the pastors of these seven churches to discard the letter. So he said, I want you to know that everybody that read it is going to be blessed, and everybody that hear it is going to be blessed. And I say that to you. Some of you all are scared of revelation. But I want you to know that there are blessings in this book that you can just read it. And sometimes while reading it, you feel yourself in the awesome presence of God. It would be real good if you just turn off uh, Search for the Tomorrow and Young and Restless and come out of General Hospital and hello somebody. Forget about all my children and, and forget about the other talk show hosts. Uh, let spring or go head on and folk fight one another and all of that stuff going on. Cut some of that off and grab this book. I declare if you read it, If you read it, it will bless you. John, I'm in verse 4. Where are you? All right. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. 
Oh, uh, when I looked at that and talked about seven spirits of God, and that's one of those debatable things that people will just jump into and go all kind of ways with it. But when I was still a teenage preacher and got kind of hung up on that, I'll tell you what the Lord directed me to. He directed me to Isaiah 11. And I want you, if you would, to maybe put a Bible marker here in Revelation. Go to Isaiah 11 for just a moment. I'm settling back down, y'all. I'm getting back to this where you need to have your Bibles. Amen. And everybody need to leave home uh, with a Bible. Now, we basically use the King James while we're in worship, and you can use the others if you want to do further study. Isaiah 11, do you have that? Amen. Now, here is a messianic prophecy, and certainly when you use the word messianic prophecy, it means a prophecy that points to the Messiah. There are a lot of prophecies about a lot of things, but the Messianic prophecies are those that points to Israel's Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah is writing, and he is talking about the coming of the Lord, and he says in verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Well, this is in keeping because Jesus is not only called the son of Abraham, but he is often referred to as the son of David. And you understand that David's father was Jesse. Is that right? Yeah. All right, out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And look at what it says here. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's one spirit which is the spirit of the person of God, the personality of God. See, first of all, if you're going to be a son of God, you've got to have the personality of God. Uh, it, it's a shame. That's why the church suffers. You got too many folk claim to be children of God, but they have the spirit of the personhood of Satan. They lie. They cheat, they steal, they cuss. They do all the things that the devil's folk do. But first of all, he says that this person, the Messiah, the Spirit of God shall rest upon him. Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of his person. That's one. And then what? The Spirit of wisdom. And not only the spirit of wisdom, but the spirit of understanding. And then the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might and the spirit of the knowledge of God and the spirit of the fear of God. I counted seven. How many did you count? Huh? All right. I counted seven. Now somebody, oh preacher, that, 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 you can't prove that. You can't prove it's not either. You, you, weren't, you weren't there before the throne, so you can't tell me who the seven spirits were. And that's where the Lord directed me. Amen? Amen. Now come on to verse 5. He said that the seven spirits of God and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. That simply meant he's the first one who got up, who doesn't have to go back. You've had some other folk that got up. I was, I was reading one day about after the prophet Elisha, that mighty prophet was being buried after he was dead and buried, that the later on the Moabites were coming through and they dropped a dead man in to his sepulcher and when that man touched the bones of Elisha he revived back to life but I'm here to tell you that man is, is dead he went back hello Jesus even raised Lazarus but I guarantee you Lazarus is nowhere walking on this earth now he had to go back but he is the only one that came up out of the grave, 
having conquered death, hell, and the grave, and will not ever have to go back in again. Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that what? Loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Oh, I tell you, self-reformation won't do it. You got a lot of folk that brag about what they don't do, and I, I, I've never done this and never done the other. You're not saved because you had the moral uh, power to stop smoking or to stop this or stop that. That's what we find when Jesus talked about the unclean spirit goeth out of man and walketh through dry places seeking rest. But when he couldn't find any, he said, I'm going back into my house. And he gets back and finds that house is clean, but it's swept and garnished. It's dry clean. It's swept. It's garnished. It's decorated. And therefore, the devil was able to come back in to that house. But when you are saved, your house isn't swept. It's blood washed. Y'all don't hear me. And not only is it blood washed, but you don't have to get trinkets to garnish it and decorate it. But the Spirit of God comes in to fill up that house. And when you are spirit filled, the devil might oppress you, but he can't possess you. Hallelujah. You got a lot of folk, you know, talking about I'm saved and sanctified, but you're talking about these evil spirits that's in. Honey, if you got evil spirits in you, you ain't saved. Pardon my grammar, but I'll say it again. If evil spirits live in you, you ain't saved. Satan will come against you. Hallelujah. He will assail you, but he can't prevail against you. He will oppress you, but he can't possess you. That's why I never could understand you folk talking about I'm saved and somebody fixed me. Scared of witchcraft and hoodoo. Uh, you can't fix me when I've already been fixed. Anybody in here can say, I'm already fixed. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Trying to not go too long with this, but uh, I feel that long-winded spirit all over me. But look at what else he says. Not only is Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But through his exaltation, he has also lifted us. That's what he said in John. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So through his exaltation, look at verse 6. And hath done what? Made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Hallelujah. Do you know who you are? When you really know who you are, when Jesus Christ is really your Lord, his exaltation lifts you. That's why I said let us exalt his name together. Tell somebody if you lift him, he'll lift you. Oh, glory. May not have a dime in your pocket, but you're not a pauper. Bills you can't pay. But glory to God, you're a king in waiting. A prince in waiting. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. If you belong to him, you are a priest that can go into the holy place. Anybody in here know who you are? I think about 25 of you that know who you are ought to just leap to your feet and say, he's made me a king and a priest. Oh, sit down, y'all. You, you. Around here fussing, getting mad, 
because the government want to end the welfare program. Thank God if he let welfare or public assistance in some way be a bridge to tide you over. But see, you can take the bridge across the Mississippi River, but you don't want to stay on the bridge. You just to let the bridge carry you over the river. And then you're back on the highway. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God will let public assistance bridge you over, but you don't need that to live on. You don't need the government to take care of you. You're a king. You're a queen. You're a priest. You're of royal birth. You're somebody. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. <laughs> Hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That word amen just simply meant it's true. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Then come the verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now you got to let that settle in your spirit. This morning I was talking to the saints from the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew where the disciples asked the Lord, uh, Master, when shall these things be? And what will be a sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus let them know that one thing that is going to happen, there's going to be a rash of messiahs. Many will come in my name. Hello? And you have never seen such a day of false messiahs. When our family moved from Memphis to Detroit back in 1952, uh, there was a fellow there by the name of the Reverend James Francis Jones, better known as Prophet Jones. And uh, from 1 a.m. Sunday night, early wee hours of Monday morning, from 1 until 2 in the morning, he was on radio and television live, building jam-packed universal triumph, the dominion of God. And the prophet said the only reason, only difference rather, and I'm not telling you what I heard somebody else say, I heard him say it. He said that the only difference between him and Jesus, God sent Jesus to do a job, but Jesus let death stop him. But he came to stop death. So the only difference in him and Jesus, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he was born in Birmingham. <laughs> and this brother walked in in his high heel shoes and his tightly fitted to look more like a dress, but they said it was a robe. Earring in his left ear, leaving the right one open, he said, because that was the ear God talked to him in. And thousands of people followed him. Hello, somebody. Before him was Father Divine. During the same time as Prophet Jones was Daddy Grace. Hello, y'all. You ever heard the name Sanyan Moon? Mr. Moon has changed his approach. Hmm? He doesn't do the same as he did at first. Now he's trying to get Christian leaders to network with him, claiming that his interest is in humanity and love and fellowship. But when he first appeared on the scene, he let you know that he came 
as the Messiah. Harry Krishna. You've heard it. Did you ever hear the name Jim Jones? I think somebody heard the name David Koresh. And right here in Memphis, at Cook Convention Center several years ago, when Mr. Farrakhan came the first time, he went and got those scriptures where Jesus said that there was one coming after. He traced it. John said one was coming after, and Jesus was the one coming after John. But also Jesus said, I've got many things to tell you that you can't understand now, but how be it? One that's coming after me. And he called him the spirit of truth. And Mr. Farrakhan declared himself to be the one that Jesus talked about. Now they've got another one. Yahweh been Yahweh. He calls himself God. He's in prison now and his folk trying to get him out. False Christ arising everywhere. But I want you to know that when Jesus comes, you are not going to have to tune in on one certain television station. When he comes, nobody is going to have to catch a jet and fly to Israel. When he comes, one passage says, it'll be like the lightning streaking across the sky. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And when it comes, he's going to have some identifying marks that don't nobody else have. Yes, he's the word of God incarnate in human flesh. In the womb of Mary, he received a body. That body went to Golgotha. That body was crucified on Calvary. Nails went right through his hands. Nails went through his feet. And then a big spear went in his side. Must have been some big holes because he told Thomas, put your finger in the nail print. Put your hand in my side. And when my Jesus comes back, won't nobody have to tell me this is him. Because when he come back first, I'm going to see him. And not only will I see him, I shall know him. As redeemed by his side, I stand. Oh, I'm going to know him by the print of a nail in his hand. He's going to let me know I am your redeemer. I am the one that was hung up for your hang up. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Hey, thank you, Lord. And every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, they're going to see him. Oh, what a mighty God. See, when he appears in the sky, according to what Paul said, everybody won't be dead. Even if it is a nuclear holocaust, it's not going to kill everybody. Said so these who are alive and remain will not prevent them which are asleep. For the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Hello, somebody. And while we who may still be alive if he come in our lifetime, while we are being caught up, graves will be bursting open. And those who crucified him 2,000 years ago, they're going to rise up out of the ground. And the very one that they pierce, they're going to look at him. And according to what the Bible says there in the Philippians, around 2, 9, and 10, it simply says that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can't you see him now? The ones that pierced him coming up out of the grave and falling on their knees saying he is Lord.
Sit down, y'all. Let, let me hurry up and get through with this. Bless the name of Jesus. Look at verse 8. I am Greek alphabet that begins it. I'm alpha. Oh, I, I know you, you sorority sisters and frat brothers. You and your Greek clubs. But you ain't in the right Greek club if you don't know who Jesus is. <laughs> you can be alpha whatever. But honey, you just toying with a name. Jesus said, I'm alpha. I'm the beginning. Everything you see, I started it. And don't you worry about the end when it's all over. Not only am I the beginning, I'm alpha, but I'm omega. I'm A on one side, I'm Z on the other, and I'm everything in between. Glory! I'm alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. John said, I'm your brother. That, that's all I am. You waiting for me to identify apostolic authority? He said, no, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. Here's a man that received this great revelation of Jesus Christ. But he tells the believers that I'm your companion in tribulation. We're in trouble today in the body of Christ because we're being taught that if your life is lined up with the Word, that if you're really what God wants you to be, that if you're going through this and going through that, that's got to be something wrong. Honey, let me tell you, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. And a lot of these people that are trying to tell you that you're not going to go through anything if you are right with God, they, they ought to quit lying and tell you some of the stuff they're going through. They're going through. Their wives are going through. Their sons and daughters are going through. They are going through everything that you are going through. As a child of God, he did not promise us that we would not go through, but he did say, when you go through, I am with you. You ought to tell somebody you can go through anything if he's with you. We used to sing that. If Jesus go with me, I'll go anywhere. It's heaven to me. Wherever I be, if he is there, I count it a privilege here. His cross to bear. If Jesus go with me, you ought to turn to somebody and tell them you can make it through it. If Jesus goes with you. Then they had another song, walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. While I'm on this pilgrim journey, uh, I want Jesus. I just want him to walk with me. John said, I'm, I'm your brother. I'm your companion in tribulation. You've got to go through, I have too. Congregation have to go through, the preacher does too. Amen. And then he goes on to say, I'm your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you just got to have some patience. He said, I was in the isle that is called Patmos. And why was he there? It was like being in a penal institution. But he said, I was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some things you wouldn't have to go through if it wasn't for the fact that you were a child of God. Don't let anybody tell you that, that getting saved and 
living for Jesus is the easy way out. You go back and read the 13th chapter of Matthew where Jesus is dealing with what is called the parable of the sower. And he talks about seed by the wayside, seed in stony places, and among the thorns, huh, and good ground. And he explains, hallelujah, a little bit later what that particular parable meant. And one of those particular types of soil he describes as being those who receive the word. But when persecution come because of the word. Some things you have to go through because you a child of God. If you weren't a child of God, there are some things the devil would let you escape. He wouldn't have to do that to you because I got you anyhow. And I'm going to let you laugh your way all the way to hell. But when he sees that your commitment is to the Lord, a lot of things that the enemy throws in your way, trying to stop you from following after Jesus Christ. John said that it was because of my testimony that I ended up out here. History will let you know that out of all of the other apostles, they died some kind of a martyr's death. But John had a special relationship with Jesus Christ to the extent that even after Jesus got up out of the grave, there around, I think, the 20 other 21st chapter of John, when they went back on a fishing trip, and Jesus was there on the shore with fish brawling on coals of fire, called out to them, children, do you have any meat? No, we toiled all night and caught nothing. We'll cast your net on the right side. And when they went on out there in the deep and launched out and threw their nets where Jesus said, fish swam into the net and the net began to break. And somebody said, you know, that's Jesus. They had had that experience early in his ministry and now they would have it after the resurrection. And when Peter heard it was Jesus, he was there in the bottom of the ship there with his naked body and took his coat and girded it around him, jumped out into the water and swam ashore ahead of the boat. And Jesus had fish brawling on coals of fire. Simon, son of Jonah, loveth thou me more than these? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And when Peter got all upset, because the Lord said to him, when you were young, you girded yourself, you dressed up, put on what you wanted to and went where you wanted to go. But when you get old, another's going to take you by the hand and lead you down a road you don't want to travel. And Peter understood that Jesus was prophesying that he would die the death of a martyr. And he looked at John and said, well, what's going to happen to this fellow? He said, well, if I will that he tarry until I come again, what is that to you? Follow thou me. In fact, they start spreading the rumor that John wasn't going to ever die. Well, John did die, but he didn't die like a martyr. When they tried to boil him, history says, in a kettle of oil, uh, something about it, even the hot oil wouldn't destroy him. Yes. Nothing they tried to do to John would kill him. So they decided, we'll banish him. And they put him on a leaky ship, sent him out into the Aegean Sea, yes. knowing that when he got to the Isle of Patmos, yes. that there either a poisonous, venomous snake would bite him or some ravenous beast would destroy him. Or else being left alone, he would go stock staring mad. And John gets out there and he does not really know what his fate is until finally it is the worship day. And I hear him say, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Mm. Oh, I feel my help coming now and said, I heard a voice behind me saying, I am Alpha 
I'm in verse 11 now. And I am Omega. I'm the first and I am the last. You didn't come out here to die, John, but what you see, I want you to write it in a book. I'm going to show you some things that have happened, some things that are happening now, and things that will happen in the near future. Glory to God. I want you to write letters to the seven churches. And while John is acting as recording secretary, the Lord said, I want to remind you again of who I am. And because of who I am, you have no need to fear. Fear not. I'm the first. Fear not. I'm the last. In other words, don't worry like he told them years ago about those that can destroy your body but destroy that one that thing you better do is fear the one that can destroy soul and body and cast it in the depths of hell don't fear your situation don't fear what any man can do i am the first i am the last i'm he that live it. If you want to know whether I got power, my power is so great that I was dead, but I didn't even stay dead long. You remember I went in the grave, borrowed the grave from Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph knew I wasn't going to use it forever. I just had to borrow it for the weekend. Lally. Sunday morning, stepped outside of the grave, dangling keys in my hand. I got power over hell. I got power over death. I've got power over everything living. And as long as you stay yoked up with me, you don't have to worry about anything the devil is trying to do to you. Long as you stay yoked up with me, you don't have to be fearful of the Y2K problem because it doesn't happen matter rather what goes on in this world. I got it all in control. The church doesn't have to worry because the church is styled as the candlesticks. And he say, I'm walking around in the midst of the candlesticks. I don't need the secretary's report. I see all you do. I hear all you say. I'm walking around in the midst of a church. I'm holding the stars in my hand. look today many places across this world the body of Christ is in trouble my God we just heard about one leader going up to serve time and I don't understand how you can be the custodian of the people of God and don't deal fairly with the money of the saints. It don't matter what denomination is in. There's trouble here. There's trouble there. And people said, look like ain't nothing gonna get better. But the Lord say, I'm walking around in my church the folk that's playing tricks I know the hooks and I know the crooks I know what's going on in the church and don't worry about my preachers I'm holding them in my hand if you belong to him you right in the palm of his hand reach over and tell somebody if you belong to him Uh, but I'm not worried I'm not upset mm -hmm. he's got it all in control he knows a 
about that alcoholic spouse. He knows about those drug addicted children. He knows about the traps they've set for you on your job. He knows about the bills that you can't pay. He knows about the pain that's in your body. have become a burden for you to take care of but he'll give you strength in your weakest hour whatever you're going through God's got it all in control
Well, you may have to do a little mixing here. But I, I hear the word of the Lord down in my spirit. Somebody that's been possessed by the powers of fear. Fear of uncertainty. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what the devil is trying to do to you. Hallelujah. But I want you to tell seven people that I don't care if you have to move out of your place to find seven people. Tell them today I lose my fear because I know the Lord has it all in control. Today I lose my fear because I know the Lord has it all in control. standing I won't extend the invitation hallelujah glory to God <laughs> yeah, thank God in just a few moments Everybody's standing now, but in just a few moments, I'm going to let most of you sit. <sighs> but those of you that know you need to give your life to Jesus, have courage, have some boldness. Don't worry about what other folk are doing. You keep right on standing if you know that you need to give the Lord your life. Backslider that once knew the Lord in blessed fellowship, but you've strayed away, but today you're ready to return to the Lord. Don't you dare sit. And then there are a number of you that's already saved. You know the Lord Jesus and the pardoning of your sins, but you also know that you are not in the place where the Lord would have you be. This is your day. You don't have to put it off another Sunday. You don't have to wait till the new worship center opens. But this very day, you can obey God. And if you're in either one of these categories, lost in sin, ready to give the Lord your life, in a backslidden condition, having once known the Lord in blessed communion and fellowship, but... You strayed away, but today you're ready to come back. And then you that know you're saved, 
living the best that you know for Jesus, but you want to make this your church home. If you're in either one of those categories, keep on standing while everybody else is seated. Don't you worry about what other folk are doing. You be honest with yourself. And you who are standing, step in the nearest aisle and come here now. Come here. If you're in the balcony, go to the elevator. Push one. Come on down. Hallelujah. Oh, how beautiful. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. God bless these young men, this young lady. Glory to Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to give him praise. else the Lord is yet speaking. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> if you're in that balcony, go over to the elevator. Push one. Come on down. God bless you, young man. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Glory to God. Come on, young lady. That's right. Come on, my darling. Hallelujah. of you who responded and came forward I'm just going to step down and shake your hand you're going to follow my assistant Elder Askew he's going to go into the Bible and if any one of you still need the question answered what must I do to be saved the question is in the Bible and what you've got to do is right there and in one minute's time every sin you've committed since you've been born in this world can be blotted out you that want to make this your church home, there'll be persons to sign you up. Tonight at 6 o'clock is another worship. I'm not speaking, but we have many great speakers. They'll be at the White Haven location at 6. And I want you to meet me back here Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Every one of you that possibly can. Oh, hallelujah. God bless you. Bless you, young man. God bless you, young man. Bless you, my brother. Bless you, my sister. Bless you, young man. God bless you, my sister. Bless you, my brother. Bless you, my sister. Somebody ought to give God some praise. Blessed by God's word today, can I hear hallelujah? Hallelujah. Woo. 
Hey!